If you're like me, which I think a lot of you are, tall and handsome. Okay. Actually, what I was going to say was, if, if you're like me, you have a lot of questions about the Holy Spirit. Um, no matter how much you study, um, how much you read in the Bible and read good authors, it's still hard to get a grasp on the Holy Spirit. And while I don't think that I can adequately express exactly who the Holy Spirit is, I think the Bible does a fairly good job of helping us understand the Holy Spirit as best we can. And so um, today uh, is the final part of a four-part series I'm doing on the the Holy Spirit. We talked about this Holy Spirit in us, uh, with us. Last year, we talked about the Holy Spirit leading us. Today, we're going to talk specifically about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You will find, you know, there have been questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit since the beginning. In fact, people were asking questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit before Christians were called Christians. The first time that somebody asked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit was on the day that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and the followers of Jesus in the upper room. Think about it. Okay? These, the, the, these group of people in the upper room, the Holy Spirit falls, they start speaking in tongues, and then the crowd hears them, and what are they doing? They're making guesses as to what has happened to them. Oh, I hear them speaking in my language. They don't know my language. How are they speaking? And some of them even said, they're drunk. Why were they saying these things? Because they didn't know what was happening. They had questions about the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be honest with you. uh, You will probably die and go to heaven before all of your answers about the Holy Spirit are answered. Uh, God, he's a very generous God. And he gives us as much information as we need. But he never gives us more than we need. Because too much information is a dangerous thing. Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 3 through 8. And then we're going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So we'll start with uh, Acts 1, 3. After his suffering, we're talking about Jesus... He presented himself to them, talking about the disciples, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When they gathered around him and asked him, and then asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then skip down to Acts chapter 2, first four verses. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that spread and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then you throw in the idea of speaking in tongues. Uh, There are a lot of people who will believe or think that if you speak in tongues, you're crazy. You're a loony. Oh, it's one of those Pentecostal churches. You don't want to go there because they are weird. Now, honestly, let me tell you. If I was not a Christian, or if I was a very... Uh, if I had never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues, and I went to a church where speaking in tongues happened, I would think the same thing. I would think you're crazy. Because it's a language unlike any other. You could probably recognize foreign languages if you hear them. 
I grew up uh, in the north. There were not a lot of um, Hispanics in the north where I grew up. And so I did, you know, apart from hearing bits and pieces on TV and things like that, I didn't really understand much of the language, even though I took it. I took two years of Spanish in college, you know, in high school. You know how much I can speak now? None. Uh, baño. One of the most important words you will know if you're a guy. Now I can recognize a lot of languages. Why? Because I've heard them. Okay? Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you the, really the difference between Japanese and Chinese, but I know that it's oriental language. You mean it get kind of... Um, I couldn't tell you as somebody who speaks Mandarin what language that is, but it, you, can, you can tell that it's a language. Um, when it comes to the bat, when speaking in tongues, a lot of questions arise because of what people don't know. And most people focus on like what they don't know, and that's what gets them in trouble. Instead of thinking about what we don't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, anything like that, let's focus on what we do know and go from there. So I'm going to look at two questions today. Um, and I'm going to... There is no way I'm going to be able to cover everything about Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues in... We would be here till this evening if I wanted to cover everything. So this is not an all-inclusive idea about the Holy Spirit and the baptism. Okay? These, are, these are what I feel God says. This is what we really need to know today. So, first question. What does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual experience following salvation where a follower of Jesus is immersed or filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism. That word right there comes from the Greek word baptismo. And a literal translation would be to submerge or immerse. Specifically, immerse in water. We talk about being baptized in water. What do you do? You get immersed in the water. So that word baptized in the Holy Spirit has a very practical idea behind it. It's not some mystical thing. It simply means you are being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Again, can I explain that to you? I don't think God necessarily wants us to explain everything about him. Now, what exactly is the purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What exactly, why are we supposed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? The first I want you to understand, I'm going to be talking about speaking in tongues. But for now, we're going to set that to the side. Because there's a big difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. You cannot take those two things and assume that they are the exact same thing. But they are, because they are not. So for now, put in your mind... Speaking in tongues over here. We're going to get to that. Right now, we're, doc we're talking specifically about what it means to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. First, um, <clears throat> what, is it, what is the purpose for being immersed in the Holy Spirit? Does it mean that all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit in your life and you didn't before? Well, no. Jesus says himself that when, um, when you put your faith in him... The Holy Spirit comes on you. So it's not like you don't have the Holy Spirit with you until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit or immersed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have the Holy Spirit with you once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, and start following him. The Holy Spirit is with you. And how do I know that? Because God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three in so you cannot have the Jesus without having the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the Father without having Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And you can't have the Holy Spirit without having Jesus and the Father. So when you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. 
So don't let anybody try and convince you that if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you, 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 you're, you're lacking something. You're not. You have the Holy Spirit. So what specifically, what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit really do for us if we already have the Holy Spirit in our lives? Let's go back up to our text. Verse 9, or verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And here's, here's the, here's, we could stop there because that's what happens. We receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. We, we, when the Holy Spirit comes on us, when we are immersed in the Holy Spirit, we receive power. A power that obviously we did not have before. It's something different than what we have already had. But he, 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 phrase, he, he puts this other phrase in there uh, that helps define what that power is for. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The idea is that this power that we get, this extra power, this power that we didn't have before, is given to us to evangelize the world. I, 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 you know, I've preached this message, not this particular message, but I preached about the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, several times, and I've shared this with some of you, uh, but I have never preached it to an adult audience before. So this is new to me. So I was trying to think of a good way of being able to illustrate this, this idea. Um, and, and nothing really satisfied my, my ideas, okay? The other day, Jeanette and I, well, I went and I picked up um, uh, Burger King, right? And when I go to Burger King... And I get my Whopper. I always tell them that I want a chocolate shake instead of a soft drink. And their question is always the same. Would you like whipped cream and a cherry on top? Of course I want a whipped cream and cherry on top. What kind of idiot do you think I am? <laughs> I want the whipped cream and Eli wants the cherry. We're all happy. The, 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 the whipped cream and, and the cherry make the experience so much better. And, and while that doesn't do the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit justice, it kind of gives you an idea that if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you still have the power of God within you. You still have the Holy Spirit with you. But there's an, another experience that God wants to give you that just enriches the life. That enriches your Christian life. That enriches your walk. And, and that is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Is it mandatory to go to heaven? Absolutely not. One of the things that I had a problem with uh, with the Assemblies of God uh, and, and I don't I don't know if, I don't believe they have changed their, their, their policy or not uh, since, since I was, got my license. But one of the things that they would not do is they would not license anybody who had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking, speaking in tongues. Um, <clears throat> the, the, here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. I'm not saying that they're wrong in doing it. It's a policy they have. And obviously, I, I, I am somewhat in agreement with them because I have a license through them. But here's the problem with uh, doing that. I know some people who are Christian pastors who are baptized in the Holy Spirit who are less than nice people. But I also know some people who are devout Christians, who are pastors, who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and who are doing so much more for the kingdom of God than this other person. So, to say 
The baptism of the Holy Spirit um, uh, is going to revolutionize your life and make you somebody who you are not now would, would, could be a false statement. I believe it can revolutionize your life. It can change the way you experience God. It can change and give you the power that you never had before. But just because you're baptized in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that all that's going to change. Because you have to be willing to make adjustments in your life. And those adjustments, what the power of the Holy Spirit does, it gives you extra strength. It enriches your life to make those adjustments. Now, back to evangelizing the world. Peter, we all know who Peter is. The guy that denied Jesus three times. You know the, the most significant thing that happened. There are two, some, two significant things that happened between the time Jesus denied, or that, that Peter denied Jesus, uh, and when he preached and 3,000 people got saved. There, there are two significant things that happened. One, Jesus had died and, and was and raised again. And two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell on Peter. Those are two significant things that happened. And the one that gave Peter the strength to do what he needed to do was when the Holy Spirit fell on him and renewed him with power to preach. The person who denied Jesus three times would not have st stood up in front of thousands upon thousands of people and preached about Jesus. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't ex uh, preach about Jesus or talk about or even be associated with Jesus at Jesus' trial because of fear, fear for his life. Yet after receiving the power of the, of the Holy Spirit in his life, he stood up. And don't, don't think that after, after Jesus was died, died and rose again, that all of a sudden Christians weren't condemned anymore. That's not the case. Christians was, people still believed that Jesus was, especially Jews, still believed that Jesus was maybe a good teacher but definitely not God in human flesh. And the disciples, when they, when they started teaching about Jesus, it was in direct conflict to what the Pharisees were teaching. Because the Pharisees were teaching, live by the law. The disciples were saying, give your life to Jesus. Now, they weren't saying, break the law, but they're saying, you don't have to be bound by all of the extra things that we sometimes tie our hands with. The Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is for you to experience something more that God just wants to give you. The question is, are we willing are we willing to receive what God has? Now, there's only one thing, if you read in scriptures, there's only one thing that um, is a prerequisite for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That one thing is salvation. Doesn't mean you have to be going to church for a year. Doesn't mean you have to go through a discipleship program. Uh, you know, if you read, there are, there are four specific places in the New Testament where, where it specifically talks about people being baptized in the Holy Spirit and then speaking in tongues. Okay? And what you find out is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was, uh, it happened right after some people were saved. And then there was a time in between when they got saved and when they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But it didn't talk about, oh, they went to church on a regular basis. Oh, they... They shared their faith with a bunch of people, or they went through the 12-step discipleship program at the church. No. The only prerequisite that, that we see in Scripture is that these people accept Jesus and were living for him. That's it. Again, 
it, it would be impossible in 30 minutes to talk extensively about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what you need to know is the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not going to save you, but it's going to enrich your life. Does that mean your life will be better after you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It'll be more enriched, but you're still going to have struggles. You're still going to have to decide to get up every morning. You're still going to have to have to decide that you want to serve Jesus, that you want to do what's right. And it's not going to be magically, oh, you're this new person, and now you're not going to have any worries. If anything, I don't want to call them worries, but, but, but God is going to put a, more, uh, a deeper passion in your life, and you're going to be more concerned about the world. There'll be more trouble in your life because you're going to want to live a, a, a holier life and not compromise with the world. And anytime you go against the world, it gets difficult. The Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is here, is given to help you. So, let's, let's move on to uh, what a, a lot of people uh, have disagreements about. And that is speaking in tongues. What exactly is speaking in tongues? And how exactly does it happen, or does it relate to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit experience, this experience you have with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's evident by a sign that is called speaking in tongues. And proved by a life that shares the love of Jesus. Okay, there's two things in there. Okay, when somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we see this in Scripture, when somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, one of the first things, and the Assemblies of God calls it the initial physical evidence. Initial being first, physical being something that can be identified, that you can be seen or heard in this, in this instance. It is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that it is the only thing that happens to you when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Which some people think, oh, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to start speaking in tongues, and that's all I have to do. Wrong. If you think the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just about speaking in tongues, you're losing out on everything that God wants for you. Speaking in tongues is part of what we identify with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it is such a small part. It is such a small part. Because what I, the, the second half of what I just said is that the evidence is by a sign called speaking in tongues. And this is the important part. And proved by a life that shares the love of Jesus. If you tell me that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, but you're not sharing Jesus with people, what good did the baptism do you? Because Paul says that speaking in tongues, talking about the gifts of tongues, doesn't do anybody any good unless there's a prophecy. So speaking in tongues, if not evident in some other way, isn't doing you any good. Now, I will tell you this. I speak in tongues on a regular basis. And there's just something, there's something about speaking in tongues. And everybody's different, you know. There's something about speaking in tongues that, that brings comfort to me. Uh, you know, uh, Paul writes that your spirit groans when, when, when you don't know what the words to say. That groaning of the spirit... Um, is speaking in tongues. You're able, you don't know what to say, you pray in tongues and let the Holy Spirit pray through you. Speaking in tongues is, is initial physical evidence, but if it is not backed up by a life that is changed, then the only person that the baptism of the Holy Spirit affected is you, and that's not what God wanted. That's not what God intended. Now, there's a danger in desiring the gift 
in desiring the gift without understanding the giver and the gift. Okay, so let's look. The giver of this gift... Okay, first of all, the gift. Let's, let's talk about the gift. The gift is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right? Some people, I, as I said this before, speaking in tongues is not the gift that God wants to give you. Speaking in tongues is a result of the gift that God gives you. The gift that God gives you is the power to be a witness. That's the gift. The result. Here's what happens is that especially in teenagers, with teenagers I see it all the time, they see this manifestation of God by people coming up here and speaking in tongues and they want that. Because it's something you see. It's tangible. Speaking in tongues. I want that. The problem is, is that is a result it is not the end itself. Even the power, even the power that God gives you is not what we should be seeking. Because yes, that power will help us. It'll affect our lives. It'll change us. It'll give us something we don't have currently. But that is not what we should be seeking. Who should we be seeking? We should be seeking the Holy Spirit. When we seek the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit immerses us, baptizes, baptismo, immerses us, gives us the power. And because we have that power, a manifestation is displayed. Problem is, is too many times we are not seeking the giver of the gift. We're seeking the gift or even the evidence of the gift. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is something we should be seeking every day. So why is that? Well, who doesn't want more of God? Who doesn't want more of God? We should be seeking, we should be seeking the Holy Spirit along with Jesus and, and, and the Father. We should be seeking more of them every day. Even if you are already been baptized in the Holy Spirit and maybe you speak in tongues... Oh, I finally reached. I speak in tongues. I'm finally there. I don't need to do it anymore. Listen. If you're like me, you don't have an, un, uh, an unlimited amount of energy. If I go two days without eating, not only am I a grumpy old man, I, I just can't do anything. I'm out of energy. I have to continually put things in my body to, to uh, recover to build energy. And the same thing is spiritually. Is that we need to continually be getting more of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit in our lives. To continually giving the power to be the effective witness that the Holy Spirit does in us when we are baptized. It's not a one and done deal. The, Holy, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit should not be viewed as an option. Now, I know I said earlier that um, it is not a requirement for salvation, and it is not. Okay? When I say that the, Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit should not be viewed as an option, it should be something we should be de desiring. Because like I said, who doesn't want more of what God has for them? If we view it... I had a, uh, I had a friend in New Jersey, and... Um, I, w I was a pastor at a, as a youth pastor at a church, and he w he didn't go to our church. He went to another church, but we were good friends. And and he he confessed to me that he was thinking about divorcing his wife. And we had a lot of conversations, and and almost every one of our conversations ended with me saying this, and I said it many times: you cannot allow divorce to be an option. Because if you ever allow it to be an option, it'll eventually happen. I would like to say that he has the three kids now. They have, him and his wife have two kids. Their life is, is great because he decided that he was not going to allow divorce to be an option. When we say that, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit becomes an option, I could live with it, could live without it. Again, it helps enrich your, your Christian walk. 
Why would you not want it? So we get in our minds that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, while is not a requirement for our salvation to go to heaven, should not be looked as something that is not important. Because, again, the Holy Spirit gives us power to do things we can't do on our own. To witness the way Peter did. Standing up there, how many of you would love to get up there and preach to hundreds of thousands of people and see 3,000 people get saved? I would. I would love if 30 people got saved when I was preaching. Acts chapter 8, 14 through 17 says this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, that Samaria had accepted the word of God, Samaritans who lived in Samaria accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come down upon them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the baptism. They received the Holy Spirit. It was so important for the apostles in Jerusalem to see people baptized in the Holy Spirit that when people got saved and they had not received the Holy Spirit, they sent people over there to pray that they would receive the Holy Spirit. That's how important it was for the apostles. Kind of gives you an idea of how important it is. Again, it doesn't mean we're going to go to hell if we don't have... It doesn't mean we have less of a life. But it does not... We don't have that enrichment that the the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings. So, let's go to the next question. We talked a little bit about what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about how can I experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First and foremost, we need to understand it is all about seeking God and what God has for you. It's about seeking God. You have to forget about seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You should be desiring the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you should be seeking, seeking the Holy Spirit himself. That's where it all begins. Again, we, we make this, uh, this false conclusion that we want speaking in tongues and our life will be good if we speak in tongues. And while it may edify your life without the Holy Spirit, what good is speaking in tongues? So th- the first and foremost thing you have to understand is when you are desiring uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You seek the Holy Spirit. You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but as a result from seeking the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that because that is key to our understanding how we can accept the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I've seen more times than not is that people, people believe that they have to be in a certain location to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's just false. Okay? They were in the upper room. The, the, the disciples and, and those, they were up in the upper room and they received the... Does that mean we all have to go upstairs? Okay, everybody grab your stuff. We're going to go up these stairs into this room. It's going to be a little crowded because it's not as big. And we're all going to be in that upper room. But maybe that's not high enough. We'll go up into the youth room that's way up there. Get as close to God as we can before we can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Nonsense. It does not matter. Location is not the issue when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is the issue? Attitude. Attitude. Again, our attitude should be seeking the Holy Spirit. Desiring the Holy Spirit. Wanting more of the Holy Spirit. Say, Pastor Steve, you keep saying that over and over again. Well, there's a reason for that. Because it's important. When we are seeking the Holy Spirit, it allows us to be immersed in His presence. And then the evidence of speaking in in tongues will come. 
One thing that we have to make sure, and that is that we are expecting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some people will pray, uh, and, 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 and they'll say, God, uh, I want to be baptized in your Holy Spirit. Well, Holy Spirit, I desire you. But they're not really expecting anything to happen. Sometimes we get exactly what we're expecting. We're not expecting anything, and so we don't get anything. I hope that every time you wake up on Sunday morning, the thought goes in your head, I can't wait to see what God does at church today. Be expecting it. People who expect it rarely get disappointed. But people who don't expect it get exactly what they're expecting. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Expect that the Holy Spirit is going to meet you, it's going to immerse you, and give you a powerful life to be a witness. Now, let's, get, let's, let's, let's go back to speaking in tongues. There are a practical, some practical things that I want to share with you. Like I said, speaking in tongues is going to be... Um, I want to go ahead and call the worship team up. Speaking in tongues is, is a physical uh, manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a representation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A better sign to see if somebody's been baptized in the Holy Spirit is how they're living out their life. That's a better sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is just a, a, an initial physical evidence that somebody has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go into, uh, 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 there would be a lot of people who say, well, can you be baptized without speaking in tongues? And there is a lot of people who will throw verses at you as to why you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people who will throw verses at you and say, you can't. I'll tell you this. Everywhere that we read um, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts, there's something going on there that is not just somebody feeling all tingly inside. Three of the four places, it specifically says they spoke in other tongues. And one, of the, one place, it actually implies that without actually saying it. But I will say this. Speaking in tongues is a natural thing when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've seen it happen, happen. Now, I don't want you to get discouraged if you've been in a service where, we, where people have prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and you didn't get filled and you didn't start speaking in tongues. Don't get discouraged. I want you to come up here if you, and I want you to expect to be, to be immersed in the Holy Spirit and expect speaking in tongues. But if, if it doesn't happen, if, if speaking in tongues doesn't happen, it is not the end of the world. I have, I have heard stories of people receiving baptism of the Holy Spirit while they were in jail. Driving down the street in their car, all of a sudden they start speaking in tongues. I have a friend of mine who was Pentecostal, raised in the Assembly of God Church, went to a Methodist church. Nobody else was speaking in tongues. God touched his life, and in the middle of that Methodist church, started speaking in tongues. Location's not an issue. It's attitude. Okay? Maybe, maybe, maybe God has a better plan if it doesn't happen. I'm not telling you it's not going to happen. I'm just saying don't get discouraged if you come up here expecting to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and and start speaking in tongues. It doesn't happen. Don't let that stop you from seeking God all the more. A couple of things that you need to be aware of before I invite people to come, come forward. One is... Tongues, it, 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 tongues, the, the gift of tongues, speaking in tongues is something that you have to actually do. Okay, I'm going to say something. 
And if you know what I say, or let me rephrase that. If you can hear what I say, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Anybody hear that? Why? Because I didn't say anything out loud. Okay, speaking in tongues means you actually have to speak. You can't stand up there with your hands raised. You can desire God all you want, but if you're not using your voice, nothing's going to come out. So, there are people who, I don't know what to say when I get up there and I start praying. I don't get worshiping God, but what do I say? If you don't know anything else to say, if you don't know anything else to say, just say, I love you, Jesus, and I want more of you and the Holy Spirit. And if you just have to repeat that over and over and over again while you're up here praying, then do it. The Holy Spirit falls when the attitude is right, when the heart is right. And the last thing, while speaking in tongues, while you you actually have to do it. The Holy Spirit is going gonna, is gonna to empower you. And he's going to, again, it's hard to describe because you just don't. He doesn't give you the words to say. You actually say the words, but you are not going to understand the words. We had prayer meeting here last night. Um, and we prayed for about 30 minutes. And almost the whole time that we were praying, I was praying in tongues. And you know how much of that I understood? Absolutely none of it. You know the cool thing about speaking in tongues is I can actually be speaking in tongues out loud, out loud, and carry out conversation with another person, understand everything they say. Now, I can't speak two languages at one time, so I have to stop speaking in tongues to respond to this person and start speaking in tongues again because it is not me who is speaking it's the Holy Spirit through me but if you never open your mouth if you never say anything the Holy Spirit can't speak through you I want everybody to stand up with me I would be amiss I would not be doing my pastorly duty if I had not first ask you if you are right with Jesus how's your relationship with Jesus is it where it needs to be have you drifted away a little bit well maybe you don't even know who Jesus is you just happen to walk through the door and hey this is a nice warm place let me come in here first and foremost let's get our eternal destiny situated Jesus came because we were broken people. And he came to heal us and to reunite us with the God who created us. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I turn away from pleasing myself and I live a life devoted to you. That's forgiveness and repentance. And then we start living that out in our daily if you don't know Jesus or maybe you've drifted away a little too far here's what I want you to do I want you to say this prayer with me you don't have to say it out loud you can, you can say it to yourself say this prayer with me and let's get, let's get our eternal destiny situated first Heavenly Father thank you for your love and for sending your son Jesus I thank you for the sacrifice you made for paying the, the penalty for my sin, for my selfishness, for my desires. You paid the ultimate price, and I thank you for that. Forgive me the sin that, I, that is in my life that ruins me, and help me to turn away from all of that and follow wholeheartedly after you. Be my Lord and be my Savior from now 
throughout eternity. I ask this. Amen. Here's how, we're gonna, here's how I want to do this. Worship team is going to start singing. If you want, again, I'm going I'm to emphasize this. Not speaking in tongues. That's, that's something that happens to the Holy Spirit for you. If you want, not the baptism, because that's a result. But if you want more of the Holy Spirit, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, and maybe you already, maybe you already been baptized. Maybe you already speak in tongues, and you just want more of the Holy Spirit. You need to be down here too. But if you want to experience the the immersion of the Holy Spirit that God has for you, they're going to start singing a song. And here's what I want you to just come up, and I want you to stand along here, and I just want you to start worshiping God. But here's the thing: I want you, to, I want you to worship God with your words. Don't be singing the song, because what happens when we sing a song is we keep singing the song. You start worshiping, worshiping God with your words, and let the Holy Spirit speak through you. But you got to make it vocal. You can't speak to yourself. you got to speak out loud. And here's what I've noticed, is that the people who are louder tend to be more passionate about their prayers. So get as loud as you want. Remember what I said about the devil. He can't read your mind, but he can sure hear you. So, they're going to start. If, if, if you want to experience the Holy Spirit like never before, I want you to come up here and join us at the altar. If you would like to pray with somebody, if you've already been baptized and you want to pray with somebody, come up, stand behind them and pray with them. Let's see God do something amazing in this service today.